Hello, and welcome to the National Endowment for the Arts webinar on the Our Town program. This is Jason Schubach, Director of the Design Programs. In this webinar, we'll give you an overview of the program and review the important things to know as you prepare an application, and we'll end with a Q&A session. We're very excited that you're all interested in the new project category within the Our Town program. Uh, Jen Hughes will not be able to join us today. She's unfortunately out um, sick. We will give a PowerPoint presentation followed by a Q&A session. You can submit questions or comments at any time using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint. We will do our best to address as many as possible during the time we have. Note that you are all muted and will only be able to hear myself. Please do not use the raise hand button. So today we're going to be talking about the new project category in our town. This is to support projects that build knowledge about creative placemaking. This webinar will be posted in our webinar section of our website. On October 1st, we conducted a webinar that was about arts engagement, cultural planning, and design projects, sort of the projects we've traditionally funded in our town. That webinar is already posted on our website. So today we're just going to be talking about the new project category. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So after four years of funding arts engagement, cultural planning, and design projects, and in response to requests from the field, we created a new area of our town funding to build and disseminate creative placemaking knowledge more broadly. This funding is being piloted this year. Let's just quickly review the definition of creative placemaking and what the Our Town program is all about. So this is the definition we use of creative placemaking. Um, it's really when artists and community developer uh, development practitioners across the nation, you know, sometimes those are the same people, sometimes uh, working together. Um, there's, it's about them striving to make places more livable with an enhanced quality of life, increased creative activity, a distinct sense of, sense of place, and with local economies that together capitalize on their local existing assets. So we're going to talk about um, the kinds of project activities we want to support in this category. So like I said, after four years of funding arts engagement, um, cultural planning, and uh, design projects, and in really in response to this uh, request in the field, we are piloting this new section. So these projects should really expand the capacity of arts and arts organizations to work more effectively with economic and community development practitioners and vice versa. And it really should, they should be working together to improve the livability of communities and create opportunities for all. The hope and intent here is that the projects funded will begin to institutionalize creative placemaking approaches within the arts sector and in other sectors, such as housing, transportation, community development, and economic development. The idea is that projects awarded will support strategic approaches to putting arts and culture at the center of conversation with other sectors. So projects in might include things like mentorships to introduce affordable housing professionals on ways to incorporate arts and cultural planning, um, into planning and development processes or for artists who want to work in the community. Um, maybe training opportunities for how transportation professionals might integrate arts and culture into the planning of their transit. I'm just giving you some examples here. Technical assistance maybe for like opera companies or theaters who want to do community-based projects. Maybe research that uncovers or identifies new case making um, or wants to build uh, or want to build a more you know, robust body of practice around how artists or arts organizations can work to improve livability in places, technology projects. Um, there might be other projects that are appropriate to organizations' internal systems of learning. The idea here, though, is to be creative. You tell us how your um, organization learns. You know, I think one of the things where this came from is we were thinking a lot about how do, how do how do, how do and where do people actually learn from? Um, we think they can learn from their membership organizations and from service organizations, but you know, the language that they learn um, that, that organizations use to teach those members about um, how to, to do some of these kinds of practices are very different. So we want you to build out new knowledge, however you train your members, um, in a way that makes sense for your organization and for your members. That's really the idea here. So these are just some ideas of what it might look like, but we want you to be creative. There are some other things to talk about. Um, the projects in this category must also reflect the following. So they do have to involve an organization's membership. It must actually uh, be projects where you're training or um, building knowledge out within the membership of an organization. It must reflect a systemic approach to building the knowledge um, for, about creative placemaking. 
uh, you must show they have clearly defined systems that provide for the management of new ideas, documentation, and potential for learning, and the sharing of technical assistance programming. So what does that mean? It means we need to, to know that your, you have an existing system within your uh, network that actually, and, and you're talking about how you're going to plug this information to that existing system. You need to have a clearly defined audience for the technical assistance and the delivery of the technical assistance. You know, the audience, let's say if you're Opera America or something like that, would maybe be opera companies. Or if you're um, the American Planning Association, it might be planners. Um, but we want you to really clearly define that audience for the technical assistance to us. You must also show that you have the right kinds of partners on board to provide the services in the project. So if you are an arts organization, I'm just going to go ahead and keep picking on our Opera America. <laughs> um, you know, you need to show that you have a place-based expert that was working with you. Or if you are an American Planning Association, you would need to show that you had an arts-based expert that was working with you. And we'll get into that required partnership in a little bit. And you must also show the artistic excellence of the arts organizations or artists that you're involving in the project, that um, you're working on projects that do reflect artistic excellence. So what are the kind of topics you could work on? I think I gave some example, uh, examples already. Here's some other just clearly these are examples. We're not limiting to just these kinds of creative placemaking. But you might want to look at things like how to create artist spaces, maybe supporting creative businesses or entrepreneurs in your community. Maybe how to do cultural asset mapping, which you know is the we is really the sort of first step in creative placemaking. How you help an organization kind of figure out who's there in their backyard um, when they're doing their work. Maybe it's around building out cultural districts or cultural facilities. Um, maybe it's about performance-based activities or public art. Um, really, it can be anything, and we're just uh, these are just some examples around um, the kinds of topics that we would expect to see people trying to build out knowledge about. Um, so we're going to, again, I said we're piloting this this year. We're, we're putting, making funding available for up to five projects. Applicants can request between um, these exact amounts, so either 25000 50000 75000 or 100000 There is a one-to-one -one match required for our grants. So if you're applying for $100,000, your entire project budget must be $200,000, if that makes sense. Um, and we can get into the match a little bit more uh, later. You can match with in-kind. Um, you do not have to have all the sources for your match completely lined up um, in, in your application process. You can just tell us where you think it's going to come from. Um, and you can match also with staffing costs. Um, and the other requirement uh, with this particular uh, category is that public documentation will need to be made publicly available. Oh, excuse me, project documentation will need to be made publicly available. There, you'll see in the application there's some information about that. We are requiring you to sort of write up a final report that we can post on our website. We're looking for you to not only learn in your system, but also help the whole country learn from what you learned through your project. So let's talk a little bit about the required partnerships and ships and applicant eligibility. So like I was saying before, um, if you are an arts-based organization, uh, membership organization, you must have a place-based knowledge consultant organization or partner identified at the time of application. So let's take again the example of someone like Opera America. That, and you want to do a project that was going to be working with local community development corporations or teaching operas how to work with them. You would need to make sure that you had at least a consultant, an individual, or an organization partner on board that would help you figure out how to do that kind of work. So vice versa, if you're a place-based membership organization, let's just keep picking on APA, um, who's that arts community development consultant that you're going to be working with that's going to help you build out that knowledge for the city planners you're working with? So um, when I'm talking about membership organizations, uh, I'm talking about organizations that have individual members as part of them. So typically, these might be um, organizations that are 501c4s. Obviously, the 501c3 would be the organization that would actually um, apply to us, but really can, any kind of organization that has a series of members that could that are involved in making great places in the country can apply to teach those members about um, creative placemaking activities. So uh, uh, we are, of course, um, uh, thinking about uh, uh, encouraging uh, additional partners. On these projects, you know, you don't just have to have those two partners of the organization and the consultant or organization partner. Um, again, we're looking here for to get real information into people's hands to help them understand how to work with artists and arts organizations and vice versa. Um, how to get, you know, uh, 
arts uh, place-based organization people working with artists and artists and arts organization working with place-based folks um, so uh, you know a little bit more about the kinds of membership organizations you know we're thinking of like art service organizations like Opera America Association of Arts Presenters um, American Sphere Arts those kinds of folks or place-based organizations like the American Planning Association maybe Housing Authority Associations um, LISC uh, Trust for Public Land those kind of folks that are out there um, and the uh, you know we again we are thinking that um, Universities might be great partners on some of these projects too, because they might be the kinds of folks um, that would that would provide maybe some of the good kinds of consulting and, and place-based information that's out there. And when we talk about place, we're talking about all kinds of places in the country, from everything from working in metropolitan communities to tribes to rural communities. I mean, there's a lot of organizations out there that support a lot of different kinds of um, places in their economic and community development, and all of those are welcome in the front door. Okay, so a little bit more specifically, um, a non the applicant must be a nonprofit 501c3 organization, and it must have at least three years of programming activity. The organizations that may apply are arts, and, like I talked a little bit about this already, arts and design organizations that provide services to the field, or national and regional place-based industry associations that provide technical assistance to those doing place-based work. Um, and I gave some examples of this kind of thing already. Um, just really quick, the designated state and jurisdictional arts agencies, those are the state arts agencies and the regional arts organizations, are welcome to serve as partners on these projects, although they, are, they cannot be the lead um, applicants on these, or, on these projects. So um, a little quick overview now of the application schedule and review process for 2015. So uh, we have a deadline um, on uh, December 15th, it's, we've sort of gone to, it's, we've changed a little bit and gone to a two-step process now. Um, on December 15th, everyone has to have through grants.gov what's called an SF-424 form. That's the general form for applying to the federal government. It's a short three-page form. It's almost like a letter of intent that you have to have in to us by December 15th. Once the, you've sent that in, we will open our online system. Everything's online now. You don't upload everything through grants.gov anymore. You do it through our the own NEA system. It's called NEA GO, and GO stands for Grants Online. Um, so that has a separate deadline a few weeks later. Um, and what you do is you can go online and um, upload everything into NEA GO through the online process. And we can talk, I'll show you some examples of what that looked like. So now it's a two-step process. Remember, the actual due date is December 15th. 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we do not accept late applications. And then there's a second deadline um, for filling out the rest of your application. After that, we assemble review panels um, to look at these applications. These will go to uh, a review panel made up of members of the American public and experts plus a layperson on, in April of 2015. Um, we'll take those to our, to our National Council on the Arts. And then um, you will be notified uh, on July 15th, um, or excuse me, July of 2015, early in the month, about whether or not you um, are recommended for uh, a grant. And then you start working with us to actually get your grant. And the earliest project start date, and this has been pushed back a little bit from last year, is October um, 1st, 2015. So let's, I'll just walk you through how you apply. So if you go to the um, arts.gov website, which is where you do, you'll do almost everything through, you go to apply for a grant. You'll click on Grants for Organizations. You'll click on Our Town. You'll then um, go over to the right-hand side of the screen, and you'll see that the, the second um, part of the, uh, most of the information is over in this column on the right-hand side. You'll see the second um, category down, Projects for Building Knowledge about Creative Placemaking, is really one that you where you want to focus the initial part of your attention. You'll then go further down the screen into the How to Apply sections, and it, you'll be totally walked through it. As I talked about before, there are these two separate deadlines. Again, both of them are at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so you make sure you actually get them in on time. Um, so for that December 15th deadline, I'm just showing you here a picture of what that SF-42 form looks like. Um, again, this has to go through grants.gov. All federal grants must at least go through initially through grants.gov. Um, and again, this um, is due December 15th. 
a little bit more about this, a particular deadline. So grants.gov um, does require that you have something called a DUNS number and that you register with SAM, which is the System for Award Management. These registrations take at least two weeks. Do not wait until the last minute to actually try to apply through grants.gov, even though it is just a simple form. You must at least try to submit 10 days prior to the deadline to be able to make sure you can work through any issues with those systems. They're not perfect systems, and people run into issues. Um, you also are required to change your password with those systems every 60 days, so that if you're applying, um, if you're, uh, you know, I've got your registered your registration now, you might run into the risk of when you actually go to apply that you haven't changed your password in the system, and that can take about 48 hours sometimes to get approved. So I'm just urging you right now to go ahead and get signed up, get signed up, go through those systems, and make sure that you you've got your password ready to go at least 10 days prior to the deadline. So really, you know, December 1st, you should be making sure that you can get through grants.gov because it is not our system. We do not have control of whether or not things get through it. And if it doesn't, we can't do a lot to help get you in if you didn't, if you didn't get in in time. Okay, so then the um, next thing you're going to see uh, on online is that uh, a draft form of what the application is going to look like in our grants, uh, the NEA GO system. So we urge that you download this, power, this PDF, take a peek at it, it'll walk you through everything that you're going to need to have prepared. Um, that PDF will uh, have all the application aspects that you need to prepare before uploading into NEA GO. You're going to um, be uploading that application plus your work samples. Uh, for these kind of applications, we would be looking um, for work samples that really reflected the quality of the consultants and the um, the, the different types of organizations you're working with. So, you know, we would want to see past kinds of technical assistance that the consultants might have worked on. We want maybe want to see um, different kinds of uh, examples of different programs that you had done to do training for your members of your organizations. Work samples will be very important in this process. Um, so you can go ahead and download that form, and then when you're when we open the system, you can just sort of copy and paste stuff into um, into our electronic system. I do urge you to go ahead and perform uh, if you're going to be typing things up to type it up in a TXT file. If you're doing it in Word or some other kind of word processing form, and you put it into the electronic form, it can look a little get a little quirky. So um, just make sure that you follow those kinds of instructions online when we uh, as when they're outlined in the application form. So again, like I talked about before, um, once your application comes in, we do panel review. That goes in. That then goes to uh, we then assign based on how well you did in panel um, amounts to the grants. Um, those, those go to our national council on the arts for approval. Those are presidential appointees who serve six-year terms, and then they go to our NEA chairman for sign-off. Um, I just want to emphasize here that if you look under application review on the, any, the application website under our town, that's a very important page to pay attention to. So applications are reviewed, at all applications at the NEA, under criteria which are in two big buckets, artistic excellence and artistic merit. So how to think about that. Artistic merit is generally kind of everything you would think that a grant would be reviewed on, the schedule, the budget, the timing. Uh, the quality of the technocrats associated with the actual application. Artistic excellence is usually about the quality of the actual artisans or the designers, the organizations associated with an applicate with an with a project. Because this is a, um, you know, really a knowledge building and teaching program, you're going to be looking. We're going to be really looking for who are you know what are the quality organizations doing that teaching? Do they have experience doing that kind of teaching or mentoring? Um, you know, that's really where you're going to kind of be scored in artistic excellence. Those things are laid out clearly. I always recommend that you print out that web sheet where those criteria are. You print your application out and you hand it to someone who hasn't um, been looking at your application uh, as much as you have if you've been writing it for six weeks um, and say, how do we do? Because that's exactly what we do with the panelists is they literally get those criteria, they get your application, and they score it against those criteria. So I highly recommend you do that. All right, so here's some resources online to kind of guide you to the types of projects we've been funding in our town in the past. Um, the, we just launched online a, a showcase of um, our town projects that includes all kinds of different things. Um, it includes about 64 case studies right now. We'll be over 70 in the next few weeks. Um, and then it includes, includes a lot of different insights um, that you can look in about how people are currently doing creative placemaking. Um, so this is the sort of showcase side of the website. You can sort it by, you can sort these projects by project settings, by project types, or by their location. 
Um, each project is um, uh, laid out in a very clear system of overview, place, community, local needs, vision, partnerships, logistics, and impacts. Um, so you can really go in and see what the works, the, uh, what's been happening in the work in, in many places across the country. Um, the intention there is, was really to show case studies of how people are actually completing this kind of work across the country and the kind of partnerships they're building. Again, like I said before, you can sort these projects in many different ways to kind of, you know, depending on if you want to see the kinds of community they're in or the kind of project type they are. Um, but then what will probably be useful for you guys, especially since you're looking at doing knowledge building, is to really look at the insights side of the page uh, of the website. This is really where we took a lot of lessons learned from the project managers and really tried to put forward an enormous amount of information that um, uh, we could collect from them around, you know, what have we learned from these projects? Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that we're hoping people work with or the kind of information they work with as they're doing this knowledge building across the country. This is kind of our first stab at it on the NEA website. Um, you know, technology projects would be highly welcome as part of a, um, a project. Uh, so, you know, spend some time ex we exploring this website. It's called Exploring Our Town. Right now you can find it going right to arts.gov. Um, it's up right on the front page. So I'm welcome to start taking some questions now. Again, use your uh, Q&A box, um, excuse me, uh, which is, again, right under the, the screen there to type, start typing some questions in. Um, we also welcome any questions from you guys or as you prepare your application. We do ask that you please email us and not call us because we get such a, such a large volume of questions. We really encourage you to um, go ahead and pop an email to ot at arts.gov. So I'm seeing some questions here. Thanks, you guys, for already typing some in. And I encourage other folks to go ahead and um, start typing in. Let me just uh, go ahead and dig in. So um, somebody asked, please define organization's membership. Um, I think that's really up to you to tell us about. Um, you know, membership organizations are like, I think we defined in the kinds of organizations we were thinking about for these kind of applications. Um, uh, so that's, uh, you know, it is this kind of art service organizations. It might be place-based organizations that support housing or community development or planners or transit authorities or um, environmental organizations that support place. I mean, those are really the kinds of organizations we're thinking about, but they do need to be membership organizations. And that's pretty broadly defined because we wanted to leave it open for whoever could come in. She has a question. If you, what if you're a place-based membership organization that also runs a major arts organization under its umbrella? Um, that's great. You know, it sounds like um, no, you would be a highly appropriate candidate. Uh, so uh, our local arts agency is considered arts-based membership organizations. Um, I think you'd have to make the case for who your membership was. You know, do you have members, members that prescribe to your um, local arts agency? You know, do you have... Uh, some kind of membership system where people pay membership into your system. I would say, you know, local arts agencies are highly eligible for the other part of our town applications. Um, you know, we fund tons of local arts agencies um, in that kind of work. Uh, so I don't, you would have to make that case to us in your application. And you have to choose one or the other. You can't apply to both um, parts of our town. Clarification question. The uh, member based organization must be the applicant, or it can be the economic development organization is the applicant working with the member-based organization. Uh, the member-based organization has to be the, the primary applicant. What about partnering with public health departments? Um, I, that's great. We would encourage people to do those kind of cross-sectoral partnerships. Um, a public health department is not a membership organization. That's a government agency. So you'd have to have a membership organization, uh, and then a, a, if the public health department was your quote-unquote place-based consultant or organization, that would be totally fine if you're an arts-based membership organization. If you're a place-based membership organization, you'd also have to show you had an arts consultant or organization on, um, in, in line there. So uh, can a city apply? We are not a 501c3, but we are a non-tax group. So cities are absolutely welcome to apply to the other kind of our town grants. Um, they're the leads many, many times on those kind of grants. Um, uh, so 501c3s or um, public entities are welcome to apply the other kind of our town grants. Cities cannot apply for this particular part of the our town grant. Um, 
Can you apply to both legs of the R Town grant? Um, oh, you can. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so um, I was wrong about that before. Sorry. Um, so you can apply to both uh, sections of the R Town grant. You are welcome to be um, a partner on either of those legs of the R Town grant. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so you can split, submit two applications to R Town, one in each area. Yes. And partner is on as many as you like. <laughs> Um, again, another question about the city being a lead applicant. Absolutely yes to uh, the other section of our town, not for the knowledge building. You can't be the lead applicant on this 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 section of our town. We discuss if an in-kind match is allowable, and it can be uh, can it be 100%? Uh, yes, you can match 100% in-kind. In um, there are requirements for uh, showing in-kind match through uh, federal grant programs. So look at those requirements online on our website. You can email us and we can send you uh, those requirements. It does require documentation. You can't just say that it happened. Um, but yes, you absolutely can um, match 100% in kind. Can you talk a little bit more about what constitution constitutes a membership organization and what you had in term mind in terms of membership involvement? So I think we've talked about it quite a bit already. I mean, a membership organization needs to show that they have members that belong to the organization through some kind of membership system. Um, uh, and uh, membership involvement, I think, what we're looking for, just to be clear on these grants, is that you are educating your particular membership in your language. So um, let's take uh, the Trust for Public Land or something like that. I mean, I'm assuming they have member organization, members of uh, their organization, which are the different, um, the different, some of the different parks and different uh, organizations that they have across the country. Um, they would, what we're looking for is for you to build out knowledge around how you would help those individual members do arts-based work. Um, you know, if members want to cross, you know, cross-pollinate again w with each other. So, like, let's say a rural development organization wants to partner with um, TCG, the theater, to, um, uh, which is a theater art service organization, um, to help rural communities understand um, how to work better with theaters. That'd be awesome. You know, you could, there could be co-learning across those two things. Can the university be the place part of the grant and partner with a local arts 501c3? Um, so that local arts 501c3 would have to be a membership organization. Um, it couldn't just be a normal arts nonprofit that would um, that would have to go on the other side of our town. But absolutely, universities are welcome to be the place-based um, uh, consultant or organization that's providing the kind of knowledge base to an arts or arts service or arts member organization. Would university schools of architecture meet the arts organization requirement? Yes, because we consider design an art form. Uh, there's a specific question about Tucson, Arizona. Um, here, if you want to email us directly at um, ot at arts.gov, we can uh, fulfill, fill you in on who the contacts are there. Um, can past NEA grantees apply for the grant? Absolutely, yes. Do you have an estimated number of applications for this year? Um, I don't know. Since this is a brand new category, we're, um, we're not sure how many applica applicants we're going to get, but we know we're only going to fund up to five. Do they have to be paid member organizations? No, we don't say that in the, um, applica in the uh, guidelines currently. Can you give more examples of high quality placemaking rooted in performing arts rather than just visual arts? I really appreciate this question. Um, I would encourage you to go look at the Our Town, Exploring Our Town um, website. Uh, you can sort projects there by festivals and performances and community arts engagement. And there's, uh, you know, there's a good 10, 10 to 15 examples we have up already. Um, we are also going to be hosting specifically on November 3rd a, um, we're going to be broadcasting a, a meeting that we're going to have here at the NEA that's going to be specifically about um, the performing arts and placemaking because we're really interested in that topic. So I encourage you to listen in on that day. And you can sign up for that under the um, webcast section of the NEA website. Is the art supposed to be driven by the community building, or is the community building driven by the art? Or as long as it's one or the other, it doesn't matter. Um, I think it just depends on how the partnerships play out locally. Um, uh, you know, 
I, I don't see those as mutually exclusive from each other. I think it really is about who's at the table, who wants to do the community building um, work. Not all arts organizations should be involved in creative placemaking, and not all um, community development organizations should be doing arts-based work. But the people who do want to do it and the sort of coalition of the willing that want to step up and do it, um, those are the kinds of, uh, of folks that we'd like to see um, you know, working together. How would a cross-sector partner, not lead applicant, demonstrate their support or partnership for the project? Should they be in the narrative and budget? Offer a letter of support or all of the above? Well, I think when you get into the application, you'll see where we're asking that um, specifically. You do have to, there is a section specifically for the partners to fill out. Um, they might be in the budget if you're, they're expecting to be paid. Paid, They'll certainly be in the narrative. And letters of support are really important in our town grants. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, our town grants are, uh, there's room for, I think, 10 letters of support. And uh, almost always, our town grants that have um, very strong letters of support do pretty well in the process. And what is a strong letter of support? Well, it's not uh, um, one of those uh, you know, form letters where we said t see 10 of the exact same letter. You know, use those letters wisely. Use a letter as a way for you to tell the story of what that partner is going to be doing. And that let that partner, um, you know, you, that's another place where you can get a little more narrative into your grant. And we will actually turn panelists towards the letters of support and say, read those carefully. You know, many people worked really hard to get the right letter of support to make sure that you understand who, um, who they are, uh, who they're working with and what those people's roles are in the project. So I have a couple questions here um, about private universities. Uh, does a private university p qualify as a member-based organization? I would not think so. I don't know who your actual members would be, quote unquote, with a university. Um, you're welcome as a university to partner with, an, with a, a service organization or a member-based organization, absolutely. Are you looking for variation among grantees, rural, urban, or geographic location, or is it purely based on who receives the highest criteria points? Um, I think that just depends on how what comes in. If we get a lot of applications um, that vary on, let's say we get a ton of applications that are all about performing arts, um, we would probably review those separately. Um, or a ton of applications about rural, rural development in rural of America, we would review this separately. Um, you know, if we get you know, not that many applications. We'll just make sure that the panel has at least one person per kind of typology that, that can properly review the project. Um, so, yeah, we'd love variation. It's a big, complex country. These, there's a lot of work to be done on this, these topics, and we'd love to see a lot of variation that would serve all of America. I noticed that you fund cultural festivals. Are you able to apply for funding in a general NEA grant and our town for the same festival? Um, so absolutely, uh, you, our town does not interfere with your ability to apply for uh, artworks or challenge America. If you're coming in for a festival, though, that would not be appropriate for this part of our town. You would want to come in for the other part of our town, which is the arts engagement um, side of the our town grants. Please email us at ot.arts.gov, and we'll give you more clarification around that. Um, is, LISC, is LISC, which is a specific organization, considered a place-based member organization? I would say yes. Are both our town grant applications running on the same deadline? Yes. Do subscribers qualify as members? Um, I'm not sure if you mean like subscribers to a theater organization or something like that. If you could email us more specifically about what you're asking about, that'd be helpful. If it's just subscribers like to a series of theater performances, that's not a member. Is there an experimental component that can be considered, meaning using art as a way to teach and understand placemaking? Yes, yes, absolutely yes. That sounds amazing. Yes. <laughs> um, can creating a membership organization, example, neighborhoods, be part of the grant, or does the membership need to be fully formed in the beginning? Well, like I said, the membership organizations have to be the lead or lead applicant, and you have to have three years of experience. So creating it um, is not. That's not eligible. If one applies for both sections of the NAR town grant, is it possible to be awarded for both, or does it hurt our case to apply for both? Um, I, if since you're eligible to apply for both, it means that you have an you have a, as fair a chance in both of them. Um, I don't think it would hurt your case in any way, shape, or form. Okay. 
So are, could a school of journalism be the arts partner, work with the local government as the place-based partner? If so, could students be considered the school's membership? Would the school need to set up a 51c3? Okay, so students are not membership at a university to us. We're talking about membership-based organizations um, that are, uh, so no. Um, the, I would, if you're looking at partnering with a government to do a project around this, I would look at, I suggest that you look at the other side of our town. So um, School of Journalism could be absolutely the arts partner, partnering with the government on an arts engagement project. We can do consider literature an art form. So um, you'd be eligible on the other side of our town, not in this side of our town. If the arts organization is primarily a youth-based member organization and our adult membership base is currently being piloted, could this organization still qualify as a member-based partner? Um, yeah, sure. Can funding pledges be contingent on awarding of the grant? Um, uh, absolutely. People do that all the time. Um, we uh, typically, when people are showing the kind of match that they'd like to have for the grant, they show that they, um, uh, in the budget, you can show what kind of pledges you might have lined up. Um, uh, with, you can let those with a star if they're actually confirmed or not. We don't expect for you to have the money um, in hand exactly at the time of application. Can the grant be awarded? Be you? Can the grant award be used retroactively? What if the project starts before notification? Um, unfortunately, no. You have to actually. Uh, you actually. You can't. No project activities can be funded until October first of next year. Do you have an estimate of the um, financial range for the grant? Well, um, like I showed on the page, uh, you have to apply for either twenty-five thousand. 50,000, 75,000, or 100,000. Those are the exact amounts that you must, uh, must apply for. So it's one of those. And again, because the total project budget um, has to be at least double that, because you must let match at least one to one, you know, if you're applying for 25,000, your project needs to be at least a $50,000 project. If it's 75,000, it needs to be at least a $125,000 project. Um, sorry, $150,000 project. Basic math. Yay. <laughs> um, so. Uh, that's that's kind of how that goes. Um, any other questions from folks? We've made it through all the ones that have been sent in. I'll just give you guys a couple minutes. I will just say again, um, please do take a peek at Exploring Our Town. Um, read the grant guidelines very, very carefully. Um, you know, this is our first year doing this, so we are trying to, we tried to write them open enough in a way so that people could, um, you know, project all kinds of different interesting projects in them to us. Uh, we are really looking for to help people in the field who want to learn how to do creative placemaking to learn, right? We want to provide them opportunities to not have to just recreate the wheel themselves every single time, but to really have good information out there that can help them know how to do this kind of community-based work. Um, okay. Uh, is it possible to receive less than the applied amount? For instance, if you apply for 50K, can you receive 25K? That can happen. Um, sometimes that happens where somebody has put in some ineligible costs, um, like that, uh, like some fundraising costs or something like that, um, that we can't fund. So we'll strike, but it's still a good grant otherwise. So we'll strike part of the costs and give you part um, partial funding. Um, and you know we don't have a ton of money to spend every year, so we do try to get to as many projects as possible. Because these are pilot projects, and we're only funding five, I would imagine um, people will probably get full funding if they if they get funded in one of these. If you've missed the first webinar, where can you see it? Um, well, that's available online under our webinar section of our website. Um, it's also linked to the Our Town Guidelines page, I believe. Any other questions? OK, great. Um, thanks so much. We really appreciate you guys. Uh, all right, sorry, one more question. <laughs> Should projects benefit the entire membership of an organization or a portion, or does it matter? Um, you tell us. Uh, we are expecting that um, whatever you learn from uh, working with, even if it's just a portion of your membership, might um, be useful to your entire membership. But it really is up to you guys to what makes sense. You know, you might do a mentorship with just three partners. Um, I don't know, let's take the National Association of County um, or Organization, NACO. Um, they work with a lot of counties in this in the country, and they want to. There's six or seven counties that they want to partner with 
to teach the county leadership about how to do art space work. Um, fantastic, great. You know, that's and they really want to focus on what they can learn and how they taught those counties, and then they, you know, use that information to help train other counties or, or produce a report from it that that can be used by other counties. That kind of thing is totally appropriate. Or even if they just wanted to work with one county, it's totally fine. Um, but it is about systems learning, though. So we are looking for what did you learn from that project and how can it help other people in the country um, do the work better. So I'm going to stop there. Again, if you have any further questions, feel free to email us at ot at arts.gov. Um, we're really looking forward to see what you guys come up with um, through this new category. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Take care. Bye.